All right. It's the last day. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about what you guys accomplished this semester and do the ISIS forms. Obviously, the last meaningful assessment is going on right now. It seems to be going well for the people that have taken it already. Um, good luck to you if you haven't already. So today, I thought what we would do is we would talk about the future, or we would t do a sort of a forward-pointing lecture. I mean, this is clearly not content that we can assess in any meaningful way with, with only one homework problem left. Um, but I wanted to give you a sense that there's more to what we've done this semester, that there's more in front of you, um, and that what's ahead is actually a lot of fun. Uh, challenging, both conceptually um, and, you know, in other ways, and exciting as well, right? So what we're going to talk about today, so at, at this point in the semester, we've really sort of introduced you to three styles of programming. Um, we started off at the very beginning of the semester for about the first third, essentially working uh, with imperative programming ideas. And, and really, even as we've continued on to work on recursive problems and object-oriented programming, we've, we've really always been programming in this imperative style. You'll see, um, it's, sometimes it's easiest when you talk about programming styles to describe what a style is by pointing out what it's not, or pointing out the alternative. And so today, we'll do a little bit of work with a declarative style of programming, and that'll give you a little bit of a sense of what imperative programming is. I think a little, well, that'll make it a little more clear. We also, at that point, about third way into the semester, we started talking about objects. And we talked about, you know, objects are a big component of, of the Java programming language. We talked about how we use objects to combine state and behavior. And you guys started to do some work using objects to model real entities. You know, so this is, you know, a style of programming called object-oriented. And then in the third half of the, third half of the semester, um, we talked a little bit about recursion. And, and that became, you know, a new, really a new style of, of programming. Um, if you look at lists, for example, we've looked at um, how to iterate over lists, but you can also approach lists using recursion. And these produce two very, very different solutions to the same set of problems. You know, so with recursion, our approach was solving problems by breaking them down uh, at each stage into smaller and smaller pieces, then smalling the, solving the smallest subproblem that we could find, and then building up a solution from those smaller components. So this is what you've seen so far this semester. But there's a lot more out there. Uh, there's a lot more to learn. There's different ways to think about how you write computer programs. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of taking you from the beginning, and we've, we've built you up with some of the basics. Um, but I want to point out, again, that there's a lot more to learn, and, and some of this stuff is going to be new and exciting, but also strange and be bewildering. Um, so the, you know, the, the, the argument I'm going to, well, so when you get out in the, in the world, you're going to end up, you know, as a working program and as a working computer scientist, eventually being proficient in several different programming languages. Most working programmers know they might have one language that they use most on a day-to-day -day basis. They're kind of their go-to for, for working on problems. Um, but there are other languages that they know, and there are even a larger group of languages that if you put a gun to their head and force them to solve a problem, they can do it. And this is equally applicable to the program, different types of programming styles that we're going to talk about today, right? Um, you know, so, so once you become more proficient, you pick up a number of different languages. Um, once you start learning other languages, a lot of times those will allow you to uh, program in different environments um, and to learn different styles of programming, right? So typical, a lot of languages that get used a lot are what we refer to as multi-paradigm. They allow you to program in a number of different styles, but most languages have preferences. Like, so for example, in Java, the object model is very central to how Java works. You can write other types of code in Java, and we're gonna do that today, but it maybe isn't the most beautiful. Java's support for some of these ideas is not the most advanced or the most elegant than, that you might find in other languages. So a lot of times when you solve a problem, you might start by choosing a language and then decide how you're gonna uh, proceed from there. This can also be, in many ways, a great way to learn new things. So if you guys are thinking about, what do I do? You know, I don't have any more daily homework problems to work on in 125. I don't have MPs to work on. What am I going to do with all this free time? Um, if you pick up side projects, 
particularly when you're learning stuff, a good way to pick up side projects is to choose them in a way that forces you to learn something new. So for example, I'm gonna do some cross-platform app development using React Native, that's gonna force me to learn some JavaScript. I'm gonna do some back-end development using, you know, some sort of machine learning framework that has a Python wrapper that's gonna force me to learn some Python. You know, this is a good forcing function. So you pick a project around the exposure to a new style or a new language, right? Which again, this can be a great way to learn. Um, and, and like I said before, most of today's programming languages, even though they might express preferences, are supportive of multiple different styles of programming. So Python, JavaScript, C++, even Java, you know, will allow you to write imperative code, they'll allow you to write recursive code, they'll allow you to write object-oriented code, all of those um, languages have an object model. Um, how central it is varies from language to language, and all of them will even allow you to write more functional code, which is what we're gonna uh, poke at a little bit today. And, you know, you go online, you can certainly find plenty of advice about which programming languages to use. I looked up an old article that I liked when I was in college, but it hasn't aged very well. Uh, it's still advising you to learn Perl. Don't learn Perl. There are certain languages that you should never learn, ever, right? Perl is on that list. Um, just don't ever learn it, unless, like, someone comes to you and says, we're gonna pay you a million dollars a year if you can maintain our Perl code. Um, it, and I would still think hard about that. Um, at that point. So, but, but programming languages differ uh, from each other, and programming styles differ from each other. And so, what I want to do over the next couple slides is sort of paraphrase an argument. This is a fantastic piece of writing, by the way. So, so Paul, how many people have heard of Paul Graham? Oh, okay. Maybe you guys are too far from Silicon Valley. So, how many people have heard of Y Combinator? How many people might read Hacker News from time to time? Okay, so Paul Graham is an incredibly famous uh, American, uh, American technology entrepreneur. He started a, um, a startup incubator called Y Combinator that's incredibly famous. A lot of the companies that you've used today uh, started as Y Combinator um, projects or companies. Um, he's written, a, he's, he's started a bunch of companies himself, and at this point he's sort of like one of these wise old elders in Silicon Valley. He writes a lot about, you know, different things. And so he has this, again, fantastic piece. I would encourage you to read some of his writing. He's, he's, very, um, he's very persuasive. So he has this fantastic piece about um, <clears throat> why they chose to use a programming language called Lisp to build this um, kind of web services company back in the 90s. This was him and another guy at MIT who's also uh, uh, pretty famous, Robert Morris. So the, his argument goes like this. So, and I'm, and I'm paraphrasing it, and I'm also sort of updating it a little bit, because he talks about programming languages. I'm gonna replace programming languages here with programming styles, right? So, so programming styles differ in vary in power. His point is that no one will doubt this. So in general, you wanna choose the most powerful programming style available to you uh, to solve a problem. That's what, the one that's gonna allow you to get the most work done. The, in this article, he talks about how the company that he and Robert Morris uh, founded was able to uh, keep up with competitors partly because they chose a much more program powerful programming language and style of programming to build this particular uh, tool that they built. And so when their competitors came out with features, they were able to replicate them really quickly. And he said people actually thought they had some insider information about what people were doing. They had spies in these companies or something like that. And he said, no, it just, we had picked a much more powerful way of approaching this problem, a powerful style of programming. Now, you know, he, he admits there are many exceptions to this rule. Sometimes you need to use a certain language to program a certain kind of device. You know, in Android, you only have a couple choices. Um, sometimes you need to use a particular library that only supports a particular language, whatever. But in general, if you're given a choice about languages to use or styles to use when starting a project, you want to choose the most powerful style available to you. This seems obvious. Here's the important part of the argument, though. When programmers um, look at styles that are less powerful than the one that they're used to using, they typically find them familiar but limited. So, you know, once you learn object-oriented programming, once you learn recursion, some of the ways that you might have solved those problems before using iterative solutions start to look, you understand them, but they seem bad. They seem kind of sad, like, oh, that's the way that, you know, me circa 2018 would have solved this problem, but now I know better, right? I've learned more, more powerful things. So when you look back on the things that you did before, those things look familiar, you understand their limitations. But here's the problem. 
when you look, so he calls this looking upwards. Well, so when you look down the power spectrum, you feel comfortable and a little bit superior. When you look up the power spectrum, you feel bewildered. Things look weird and strange. You may not understand why anybody would ever do things in this particular way, right? You might start reading about some new language and it just seems really odd and none of it makes any sense and you're like, why does anyone use this? And then you just give up and go back to, to doing what you were doing before. Part of his argument is that once programmers mature, they very rarely actually switch languages or learn new things. They get sort of stuck in this pattern, mainly because they don't understand that when they're looking at more powerful styles of programming, they don't see that they're more powerful, they just feel confused. You know, they, they, they're like, this is weird. So here's a, here's a quote from the article, and again, this is heavily paraphrased. So, you know, as long as our hypothetical programmer is looking down the power continuum, she knows she's looking down. Styles less powerful than the ones she uses are obviously less powerful because they're missing some features she's used to. So for example, if you tried to program in a language that didn't support objects or something like that. But when our hypothetical programmer looks up the power continuum, she doesn't realize she's looking up. What she sees are merely weird styles. She probably considers them equivalent to what she's used to, but with some other hairy stuff that she doesn't understand. How she programs is good enough for her because it's how she thinks, and this is true. When you get used to a particular language or a particular style of programming, over time it starts to influence how you approach problems. And it can be very, very hard to break out of that rut, right, and, and try something new. So you guys have to keep doing this all the time. But let's think about how we got here, right? So let's go back and trace our progression this semester. So we started off writing this purely imperative code. And that was great, it allowed us to solve certain problems, and actually we can solve any problem just using a bunch of functions and a main method. But, you know, eventually we started to realize that, hey, this idea of co-locating data and um, algorithms, um, methods and state was kind of useful. It allows us to model real world entities, you know, and so we started to learn how to use objects. And that became very natural to us, or, or maybe it, you're still getting there, right, which is fine. So that allowed us to, to do certain things, and then when we started working with trees, there are actually ways to iterate over trees. They're pretty terrible, um, but we wouldn't do that because we would use recursion. Some of these, you know, we have memes on the forum about how recursion doesn't make sense to people. That's normal, right? Do you know why? It's because you're moving up the power spectrum. Recursion is a more powerful way of approaching certain types of problems, and so as you've learned it, you've felt a little bit lost, a little bewildered, right? If, if you started reading heavily recursive code before you know what you were looking at, you might be like, I don't get this, right? Where are the loops, you know? Um, so, so this is, you know, many of you, again, have felt uncomfortable or bewildered or a little bit lost at various points throughout this journey, and part of the reason that I've got you here is that we've been pushing you, right? Once you get off in the real world, this doesn't always happen. Sometimes you get stuck at one of these levels and you don't make any more progress. Right, so that's the real hard thing to do, right? So there is a lot more to learn. There's a lot more above you in the power spectrum, right? There are a lot of much more powerful programming concepts and ideas for you still yet to learn, right? And I wanna talk about one of them today. So let's talk, let's introduce a motivating example, and we're gonna first show how we would do this right now, and then we'll introduce some new ideas that Java actually supports maybe not as nicely as we would like, they'll allow us to, to do this in a new way that turns out to be much, much more powerful. So let's say that we have a group of dogs, and I'll show you the dog class in a minute, that have names, ages, and birthdays, and I wanna write a function that, given a list of dogs, um, you know, filters the list, reduces the list to only dogs that have certain properties. So maybe dogs with an age, uh, greater than a certain value, or maybe dogs that have a birthday on a particular day, or maybe dogs whose names start with a particular letter, okay? So we can do this right now, right? How would we do this using our current set of ideas? Well, here's my starter code. I've got a list, and I've got, so here's my dog class. The dog has an age, a birthday, and a name. You can think of that birthday being like, um, a cat, like a date, uh, the number of the day in the year from zero to 364. Um, 365, I guess, if it's a leap year. It's not that particularly important. I've got my constructor, I've got my little setters and getters, and I want to find the dogs whose birthday is a particular day, day 100. 
So how would I do this right now? Well, um, I'm gonna create a new list. I'm gonna call it filter dogs. It's gonna start out empty. And then I'm going to iterate over the dogs in my uh, original list. And I'm gonna say if dog.getBirthday is equal to 100 filtered dogs.add dog. Now when I'm done, I have all the dogs whose birthday is on date 100. Let's make sure this is the right group. Yeah, it's just Choo Choo. Let's try date 88. These are some of Choo Choo's friends from dog group, Baloo and Lulu. I actually don't know when their birthdays are. I don't think they're on the same day, but just for the purpose of, um, purpose of this example. Okay, so, so this, this works. This is, how we, this is how we would solve the problem right now, right? Um, we have a loop. You know, this is, this is iterative code, right? We're showing the computer uh, how to solve this problem. And this is, in many ways, sort of a great example of imperative programming. We're showing the computer how to solve the problem we want to solve. We, what we want to do is we want to take the list and we want to filter it based on some criteria, but what we're having to do is we're having to say, okay, how do I actually do that? Well, I start with an empty list, I loop through the first list, I go item by item, if the item matches some, you know, criteria that I've established, then I add it to the new list, and when I'm done, I have this new list that contains the, the dog references that I want. So there's a different style of programming. Again, these are programming styles, right? Not, not necessarily languages, right? That's called declarative. So imperative, we spend a lot of time telling the computer how to do everything. So here's an example of a piece of imperative code. I'm showing I'm telling the computer exactly the steps that are needed to filter this list according to this criteria. With declarative code, what I do instead is I say more about what I want. I, in, in this case, I say, give me only the items, and these are comments because I don't know how to do this in Java yet. But wouldn't it be great if given a list, I could say, just give me only the items in the list where dog.getBirthday is equal to day. If you look at this code over here that we had to write to get this to work, really the only part that's doing the work is this one statement right here. This is my criteria. If I wanted to change my filter to do something different, let's say that I want to find all the dogs uh, above a certain age. So let's say get age is greater than 10. Right, so what did I need to change? Just that one statement. So this is one of the features of imperative code in the sense that there's a lot of extra machinery here to, that's, that's sort of hiding this one little bit, right? Wouldn't it be great if I could somehow pull this one condition out of this entire uh, loop and just be able to tell Java, please take this list, filter it for me based on this, this truth test, right, that I can run on a dog object. All right, so how do we do this? So, so let's start working on this problem. So I've got us started here. So I'm going to add this to my, to my example class. This is a, a, a static method called filter dogs. It, it will be static once we uh, look at it in, in, the, in the code runner. Um, it takes a list of dogs, right? And this is all the stuff I'm showing you here is the boilerplate code that I have to run for every different test. No matter how I want to filter the dog list, I always need to create a new empty list, go through my original list, item by item, and test every dog in it based on some criteria. So I know a lot about how to solve this problem already. What I don't know is, you know, clearly filter dogs has to receive a list of dogs, but what's the next argument? I need some way to specify the test that gets run on each dog. And then I'm gonna use it inside my loop. So the two things I'm missing here are a way to pass something to this function that I can use to test every dog to see if it should be in the new list, and then a way to use that inside the function itself. So those are the two things I need. There are languages that support something that are called first-class functions. So what's a first-class function? A first-class function means that a function is just another part of the language. It can be stored in a variable. It can be passed as an argument. 
So, so here's an example uh, from JavaScript, right? So this is how you would write this code, roughly this code in JavaScript. Um, it looks pretty similar, although the types are gone and things like this. Um, so I've got this function called filter dogs. It takes the dogs and a filter, and it goes through the dogs. And you'll see filter is a function. I can call filter on each dog instance, and if it returns true, I add it to the list. And down here, this shows how I, this, this is actual real code. This shows how I can do this. I pass a function. This is actually not just a function, it's an anonymous function. It doesn't even have a name. We'll talk about those in a minute. So here, I'm filtering the dogs to only return dogs whose age is greater than 10. This is valid code that I can write in JavaScript, a language that supports first-class functions. But why am I showing you JavaScript code? Because Java doesn't support first-class functions. Darn, okay, so maybe we're stuck at this point. In Java, I cannot save a function to a variable. It's not something that the language has supported or ever has supported. But it turns out that I can sort of still accomplish this. So let's go back to our motivating example and, and, and think a little bit more carefully about what we want. So I need to pass something as the second argument to this function, and my requirements are that the filter dogs function needs guarantees about what it can do with that argument. Something in the language has to ensure that, for example, I can call a particular function on that argument, but I still want the caller to be able to provide an implementation of this filtering function that's flexible, that can do whatever it wants, okay? So can anyone lead me in the right direction here? We've already seen a part of Java that allows me to do this. It allows me to make sure that I can do a certain thing with this object while still letting the implementation be up to the caller. What's that? Well, I'm gonna use a reference variable here, but, but what Java feature allowed me to do this? Something we talked about back when we talked about objects. I had a way to pr pr create a contract, right, where the call, the, the, the person who receives this reference, the code that receives this reference knows that it will do certain things, but doesn't have to care about how those things are actually done. What was that called? Yeah. It's called an interface, indeed. So in Java, I can use an interface to do this. So here's how this looks. I create an interface called dog filter. This interface specifies that to implement the dog filter interface, I have to provide one method. That method takes a dog as a reference and returns a Boolean. That method is called include. That method determines whether or not the dog should be on the list. So now my code looks like this. So I've got a, a function called filter dogs, returns a list of dogs, takes a list of dogs, and an interface reference. So a reference to something that implements dog filter. So now filter dogs knows on line seven that it can call include on this reference and pass it a dog object. If that function returns true, the interface documentation needs to make this clear that you, know, you implement this and if you want the dog on the list, you have include return true and if you don't want the dog on the list, you have include return false. So this will work, so we're getting closer. So filter dogs knows it can call include, and the caller can implement the dog filter interface any way it wants. So let's see this actually work. So I've got my filter dogs function, I've got my uh, interface. Right now I don't have an implementation of this interface, so, so let's, let's provide a, a simple one. So let's call this public class um, age greater than 10. Let's say implements dog filter. I have to implement this one function. Take the dog as an argument. I'll say if dog.age is greater, or I'll just do this. Return dog.age is greater than 10. Great, so now I have a filter. So now let's do this. Let's print the result of calling filter dogs on dogs and a new instance of my dog, what is it called? Age greater than 10. Greater than 10. All right, I 
don't need the birthday. Let's see if this works. Oh, it's angry at me about something. Oh, I think I've got a. There we go. Uh, okay. Oh, I need to use get age. Good. Yeah, it's still angry about something. Oh, dogs. There you go. All right. So this works. If I want to filter in a different way, let's let's make this filter a little bit uh, more flexible. Let's have it take a uh, threshold as an argument, because this is just a class in Java, so I can uh, override the constructor to set the threshold. And now we'll say dog age is greater than threshold. So now this filter is a little bit more flexible in that it will allow me to filter based on any age. So if I say zero, it should get everybody. Yeah, okay. So it's kind of nice. Um, you know, like, there's still a lot of extra machinery hanging around here. Um, so it turns out that I can make this a little bit nicer by exploiting a couple of new features of Java that we haven't talked about yet, we haven't really needed yet. So the first one is something called anonymous classes. So in Java, if I want to create a new, if I want to override a class or create a new class that implements an interface, and if, I, if that class doesn't need a name, it's only gonna be used once, then I can, I can do this. So this is new syntax. So I use new dog filter is the name of the interface, and then immediately following in braces, I provide an implementation of the one method that I needed to override. Or in this case, I needed to implement it. It's an interface. So when I'm done, birthday filter will contain a reference to this class. We call these classes anonymous because they have no name. You'll see that this, this is like uh, a filter that uh, returns true if the dog's birthday is 100, but there, this class has no name, right? There's no name for it anywhere. The only name that appears is the dog filter interface. So if I wanted to create another instance of this class somewhere else in my code, I couldn't do it. I'd have to use this syntax again. Um, I can also do this with um, extension. So there's a case where I'm implementing an interface. I can also use this to extend an existing class. So here I've got a dog class. I can create a sweet old dog class that extends dog by saying new dog and then overriding the two string method. You guys may have, you, you have seen this when you've been doing some Android programming. You weren't sure what it was. Maybe you found it in some of our examples or you found it on Stack Overflow or something like that. Um, but this is used throughout Android pretty heavily, this idea. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is instead of, um, instead of using, having to create a new class, I can do this a little bit more elegantly. So let's filter our dogs list, past dogs, and then we'll say new dog filter, I have to, uh, provide an implementation of include, so I'm gonna say uh, public boolean include dog dog turn dog.age is greater than 10. Oh, it's angry with me now. Okay, Will this work? No, oh, it's, let's see here, so this closes that. This closes that, that was good. Oh, sorry, I had the same problem as last time. There we go, okay. So now I'm getting there, getting closer and closer. So my goal here was to be able to, to provide a specification of what dogs to include as my argument to my filter dogs function. Originally, without anonymous classes, I had to do this by creating a new class that implemented the dog filter interface. Now I can just do it by passing an implementation of that class. So again, I can, I can do whatever I want here. I could say if dog.getBirthday is greater than 10, that's gonna return everybody, right? So, so now I'm getting closer, but there's still some um, unnecessary syntax here that I would prefer to get rid of. 
So, as Java has evolved, it's made this type of thing easier and easier and cleaner and cleaner. So this is even newer Java syntax that I can use to get me even closer to the point where I'm writing extremely clean code that just declares what I want to do. In this case, I'm going to use Lambda functions. So this is, again, something new in Java as of, I think, Java 8. So a Lambda function, what is a Lambda function and when can I use it? So this arrow syntax is equivalent. So here's my, here's my uh, way of creating a filter using an anonymous class. I create new dog filter, and I override the include method. That is equivalent to this. So this is new syntax. We've never seen this before. I have this arrow operator. I've never seen this before in Java. This arrow operator says this function takes an argument dog and returns and, and runs this code, whatever code follows in the brackets. If I'm only gonna return, if there's a single statement and it's a return statement, I can actually just write this. So this is what's called an anonymous function or a lambda function. It's a function that has no name, but it's stored in this dog filter reference variable. Lambda functions are, you know, it, it sounds, how many people have heard of Lambda functions before? Okay, probably people that have done some work in Python, where they are ubiquitous. But a Lambda function actually has deep theoretical roots. Um, the name comes from work by Alonzo Church on a formalizing a mathematical model of computation. As part of that, he used this idea of a Lambda function. Sometimes they're written as function literals, anonymous function, lambda expression. Um, it's a function definition that is not bound to an identifier. Anonymous functions are often arguments being passed to higher order functions, we'll come back to talk about them in a minute, or used for constructing the result of a higher order function that needs to return a function. So again, I'm talking now about functions that take functions as arguments, functions that can return functions. So, so again, normally we've named our functions throughout this class. That's how, you know, when you declare a function in Java, you provide it a name. This function has no name. If I wanted to, I, it, it's, I have a reference to it, but I don't have a name for it, right? It doesn't need a name. Okay? So now, yeah, Python uses Lambda, actually. Um, so now we're, we're pretty much as close as we're gonna get in Java to being able to use first-order functions. So in Java, I can't save a function to a variable, but I can do the following. I can create a functional interface. Ah, so that's one of the other things that's interesting about this. So if I go back and look at this example, you might think, what happens if my interface requires implementing two methods? Let's say that I had an interface dog filter and I had include or reject or something like that. If, it's th if that's the case, I cannot use a lambda function, because a lambda function only represents one function. So an interface in Java that only requires implementing one method has now sometimes been refer started to be re referred to as a functional interface, because instead of having to use this anonymous class syntax from lines four to eight, I can simply use the lambda syntax instead. All right, so again, I have gotten to first class functions in Java by combining functional interfaces, so interfaces that only require implementing a single method, with lambda expressions. So using this new arrow syntax, I can now extremely cleanly create an anonymous function that implements a single piece of logic. All right, so let's go back to our example, and let's, let's finish this. Oh, there it is. Okay, I've already done it for you. So now my filter dogs method takes as its first argument a list of dogs, and its second argument this lambda expression. So that lambda says, given an argument dog, return whether dog dot get birthday is equal to 100. <coughs> Excuse me. I can implement anything, any sort of truth test here I want. I could say if dog dot get name dot starts with C, 
I'm just going to get choo choo. Questions at this point? There are a lot of new ideas in a very short period of time. Yeah. Nope. Nope. So the question was, does it only work with Booleans? Um, no, I can create a functional interface. Uh, if I create a functional interface, the uh, return value can be anything, and the arguments can be anything. Right? I can take multiple arguments, I can return objects, booleans, integers, whatever. Now, in this case, um, if I changed my dog filter interface, I'd have to change the filter dog's method, because the filter dog's method uh, expects dot include to return a boolean. Right? But yeah, no, I, 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 the functional interfaces, the function can be anything. Great question. And, and in certain cases, we're going to want it to be, very much want it to be other than an integer, or sorry, other than a boolean. We'll get back to that in a minute. Other questions about this? Again, may look a little bit bewildering at first, but this is actually really cool, right? And it's really great that Java has support for this. So, we heard this new term a few minutes ago, higher order function. What is a higher order function? So, higher order function is a function that takes or returns a function. Dog filter is now a higher order function. Sorry, filter dogs. Again, I know in Java we can't pass functions around, but because its second argument is a functional interface, essentially dog filter is a function that it is applying to each element of the list to determine whether or not that element should be uh, kept. So a higher order function, again, is a function that either operates on as an argument or returns another function. This is an incredibly powerful idea, actually. When you start writing you know, really sophisticated code in languages like Python and JavaScript, you find yourself writing functions that take functions as arguments and then wrap them or do other things with them, right? This is a very, very powerful idea. Okay. So, common, uh, so, so common higher order functions, right? So, so there's a, there's a series, and if you look at libraries and, and a bunch of different programming languages, you see certain higher order functions that are extremely general, they get used a lot, right? Particularly when operating on collections, like lists. So, filter, that's what we've been working with. Filter takes a group of objects, or a group of entities, items, whatever you want to call them, and essentially reduces them to the ones that pass some test. The test is a function that I pass to the filter higher order function. The filter applies that test to all of the objects and only keeps the ones that match or the ones that uh, return true. Map. So someone would just ask, can a higher order function, can, sorry, can a functional interface return something that's not a Boolean? Absolutely. So what a map does is it takes all of the elements in a list or a collection and it transforms them in some way. It applies a function to them and it replaces them, it creates a new collection where every object or item in the original collection has been replaced with the result of calling this function. There's also something called for each. <coughs> so this is sort of like a for loop in a functional setting. This performs some operation that does not produce a new item, right? So for each um, in Java streams, which we'll look at in a minute, is a, minute, is a terminal operation because once I take a group and run for each on it, I don't have another group of items to keep working with. But this can be useful for doing things like printing or whatever. Okay, so now we're, we're gonna try to strip this down to the point where it just gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and more and more powerful, and we're gonna show you some of the generality, right? So let's, let's look at the pieces I had to introduce into this problem to get this to work. So I created this dog filter interface. Do I really need to create this interface? I just said that filter is a very common higher order function. So does it really make sense for me to create a special dog filter interface for just filtering dogs? The answer is, of course, no. And Java already supports a bunch of different functional interfaces for doing really common operations. So here's an example. This is a uh, functional interface called predicate. Predicate takes a single object and returns the, um, the single thing you have to implement to implement predicate is test. 
test takes an argument of type T. This is a generic interface. So this is bringing together a lot of the things we've seen recently. It takes an argument of type T and it returns a Boolean. So this is now a generic, uh, truth test that I can use for any filter function, okay? So I don't need to implement this, this, uh, special interface myself. I can just use the one that's already out there. Also, what about this piece of code? This is a special function called filter dogs that takes a list of dogs and applies this dog filter. But this is a more, like, th there's a pattern here emerging, right? This is a more general pattern. I have a list of objects, I apply some tests to all of them, and I return a list containing only the ones where that matched. So do I really need a dog-specific filter function? The answer is no. And in fact, Java lists already have a function called remove if. So remove if takes a predicate, remember we just talked about those, and it will remove all the elements that satisfy the predicate. So this is sort of the opposite of what we were doing. We were keeping ones that satisfy the predicate, this is removing them. But this is already built into the list, uh, interface. So now, what I can do is I can say, I'm gonna create a new list of dogs, I'm just gonna copy my original list. <coughs> and then I'm going to say dogs.remove if. I have to pass, sorry, filter dogs.remove if. I have to pass a predicate. That predicate, in this case, I'm gonna say dog return dog dot get age less than 10. I can use my lambda syntax again here, and then I'm gonna print out the list when I'm done. And, oh, I need a return, I need a, there we go. <coughs> so you'll see no dog specific filter interface, no dog specific filter function. These are general. That's one of the things that makes them so powerful. These higher order functions for working with collections can operate on any type of collection. Okay, so, where have we gotten today? Really what we started to do today is explore some of Java support for a programming style called functional programming. Again, this is a style of programming. It emphasizes the following thing. So, we've looked at solving problems through iterative solutions using loops. We've looked at recursion, solving problems by writing functions that break them down into smaller pieces. Functional programming emphasizes solving problems by composing functions together. By taking a group of elements, for example, and then applying one function and another function and another function, frequently using higher order functions to transform my collection. This leads to much more declarative rather than imperative code. I spend a lot of time telling the computer what to do, but not how, which is actually really cool, uh, because it's, it, it allows you to get a lot more done much more quickly. Reusable high order functions, like the ones we've been looking at, remove if, map, and filter. So these in Java can be applied to any type of collection, not just dogs, whatever. <coughs> One thing I wanna point out is if you're interested in functional programming, and you should be, uh, because it's very, um, this is a style that started to pervade pretty much every programming language, and, again, it's more powerful. It just fundamentally is a more powerful way of thinking about how to program. If you learn how to do this, and unfortunately, you won't necessarily be taught this in some of the downstream classes here, but if you learn how to do it, you will have an easier time getting internships, you will have an easier time writing your own code, and you will just enjoy life more and feel more like a superhero who can write really great code. Java is not a great fit for certain aspects of functional programming. So functional programming also emphasizes, for example, pure functions, functions that have no side effects, and immutable data. Never modifying data, just making copies of it and transforming it in some way. Both of these really come up hard against Java's emphasis on objects with that combined state and behavior. So if you really want to learn functional programming, I would encourage you to pick up a language that has strong and very opinionated support for it, um, like OCaml, or if you really want to go off the deep end, learn Haskell. Uh, that'll really force you to think about things differently. 
All right, I'm gonna wrap up by, sh by really sort of showing you all the way that we can get with this in Java. So Java supports, Java collections, lists, sets, hash, uh, maps, support a new interface called streams. And streams allow us to really take this idea of functional programming to its extreme. So this is valid Java code. What does it do? This is starting with a list of dogs. The first thing I do is I convert it to a stream. Once I have a stream, then I can apply a series of transformations. These are all higher order functions. Filter, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna only keep dogs whose age is less than or equal to 10. I've just run one higher order function. I'm gonna run another higher order function, remember map? Map, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace everything in my collection with the name of the dog. <clears throat> because dog.getName returns a string, and so now I've taken all the items in the collection and replaced them with their names. Now I run another map. Now I'm actually, and this is again, new syntax, that I don't expect you to understand, but what I'm doing is I'm running a, a method from the string class called to uppercase. So this is gonna take all of their names and convert them to all uppercase letters. Then I'm gonna sort them. I can sort with a single, single call to sorted. And then finally, I have this for each. Streams require a terminal operator. So with the collection that I have at this point, I'm gonna print them all. So again, I'm using another, these are uh, function references. So let's see this in action. Again, I've got my dogs. I started off by filtering them to get ones that had an age less of 10 that left only Lulu. Then I replaced all the dogs with just their names, uppercased them all and sorted them. Let's change this a little bit to make sure that our sort works. So let's say that less than 16, perfect. I'm doing a lexicographic sort because there's strings at this point. So just pause for a moment and think about how much code you would have had to write to do this using loops and a bunch of lists. It would have been a nightmare. I mean, you can do it. It's like 30 or 40 lines of code. One loop to get the dogs that just have an age, right? And then a second loop to, you know, fill in a list of strings, right? And a third loop to uh, convert those strings to uppercase. Maybe you can combine some of these together or whatever, but it's, but it's ugly. It's ugly and it's verbose. This is compact and powerful, right? I mean, we're, we are really at this point, almost to the point where we're really just telling the computer, we're telling Java what we want, not how. Java knows how to execute a map. It knows how to execute a filter. What it doesn't know is how we want to filter or how we want to map uh, the objects from, from one thing to another. Okay, so at this point, we've, we've, got, we've gotten where we want it, right? So this is really how you do this in Java. Declarative programming. Just give me the dogs where dog at birthday is today. I can write this using the stream as this single function, right? And there's very, very little extra imperative logic in here, clogging things up. So, as you guys go on, please have fun, you know, learn new things, but, but keep something in mind. Um, when you encounter something that seems new, confusing, it might be something that's actually much more powerful that you're just not comfortable with yet. So don't get scared off, throw yourself at these things. If, if there's something that a bunch of people are doing that seems unusual to you, they're probably doing it for a reason. All right, um, let me just quickly go through some details of the project fair as you guys are packing up. Thursday morning, we will email you to tell you where to set up. We have like 20 rooms that we're using in Siebel, so it's important that you go to the right place, but you'll get an email. Your group will get all get an email telling you where to go. Um, please try to sh show up a little bit early to set up so that we can start judging right at 5 p.m. It's important we get started. We have a lot of projects to judge. It's gonna be a challenge to get them done within a couple hours. From 5 to 7.45, you guys will be doing the demos and judging. You know, I hope you guys will uh, also take some time to walk around and check out what other students have done. Eight o'clock, we'll be back here in Follinger. I know it's like a 10 minute walk. I know it'll be cold. There will be prizes awaiting. Um, and we'll, so we'll do that, we'll do some awards here, and then we'll be done. So on Wednesday, we are going to do the ISIS forums. First, I'm gonna present some summary statistics for things the class did this semester. Um, I'll take 
I'll take bets on the forum in terms of how many times did you guys look at the slides so far this semester. Um, but I'll tell you exactly on Wednesday. Um, so the, we're gonna do the ISIS forms on Wednesday. I'm gonna give you most of the hour to do them. These are extremely important. I will tell you more about why on Wednesday and how previous feedback from the semester before really changed things for this semester in a, th in a way that I think was really, really good. Um, so please show up on Wednesday to do that. It won't take the whole hour, uh, but your feedback is really important. All right, uh, good luck with your uh, midterm if you haven't taken it yet. Good luck finishing up your final project. I have office hours at 10. I will see you guys on Wednesday.